Baker and welcome to part three of COVID cryptography. So um, in case you're wondering about the production values, watching this in two years into the future, this is when we were all locked down because of the virus. Okay, so in the previous module, I looked at message digest functions, which are really useful uh, cryptographic primitives. And in this presentation, I'm going to be showing you how we can put message digest to work without using any other cryptographic functions. Well, with a, except for Bitcoin, that, that does take one more bit, but we'll get to that. So, um, so message digest, what can we do with them? Well, one very important use for message digest functions is as a good hash function. If you want a hash function of a, with 128 bit output or more, there really aren't very many choices out there that aren't designed as cryptographic hashes. Uh, there is one that I know of that was um, developed uh, in response to a patent lawsuit that I was uh, an expert witness in for some of the defendants in, uh, where somebody was claiming to have uh, come up with the idea of using this cryptographic hash as a hash function. And if you understand the history of where they came from, you pretty soon understand that that's nonsense. People have been using MD5 as a good hash function pretty much since it came out. It was used in Harvest, which was a system that became two cows, uh, which was a, an early uh, forerunner of Akamai. Uh, it was used uh, in most of the early um, search engines, including AltaVista. And you know, today uh, you'll find Akamai, Google, Facebook, and all the rest are using cryptographic hash functions as um, just as a general purpose hash. And you know, they're, they're very solid. You can get cryptographic accelerator hardware uh, for when you actually need it. And you know, they're, they're a good choice. Um, there is one thing to be a little bit wary of though. Um, if you're going to use any cryptographic function for any reason whatsoever, you really should be using a accredited uh, industry standard uh, hash function that is still current. You know, don't use MD5, don't use MD4, don't use SHA-1. And the reason for that is that even if you think that you're not worried about the security implications, you're just using it as a hash function, you may have assumptions there that uh, are security assumptions that actually rely on that being a cryptographic hash. And with finding out whether or not you do is a very expensive process if you do it right. And it's much cheaper to use a good solid fa hash function like SHA-2 than try and use an obsolete piece of TAT and then try and work out if that's okay. It's not as if the old functions are that much faster than the new ones. The other reason is it's a question of style. Um, the cryptographic functions you use in your applications, you can think of that as your resume. And if you are using uh, old obsolete crypto, that is really turning up to an interview in a clown suit. And even if you have a part-time job as a circus clown, you know, if you're trying to interview for Goldman Sachs and you turn up in a clown suit, chances are you're not getting a job because all the interviewer is going to be thinking of the whole time is, why is this person wearing a clown suit? And it's the same thing using SHA-1, MD5, MD4 or whatever. It's wearing a clown suit, so don't be clown yourself. Now, these are interesting applications, but they're not really crypto. You know, maybe I'll do another module on how search engines work uh, later on, but that won't be part of this course. 
what I'm trying to do now is to use the fact that you're all locked down into your houses to teach you some crypto, which is something that I think everybody in the computing field needs to understand as part of the basic tools of the trade. So another use for uh, Message Digest, which I mentioned in the previous module, is as fingerprints. And we've all seen the code download screens where they have the fingerprint of what you're downloading. It's a very good way to check that your download hasn't been mangled in transit. And, you know, it's important to check. You know, if you download uh, a 10 gigabyte file over a telephone connection, you know, over dial-up modem, uh, you know, chances of one bit being flipped, you know, quite you know, maybe, maybe they're quite high and that one bit flipped, you know, if that's in the middle of your operating system kernel, that's bad. And so, you know, it's really a good idea for sites like Raspberry Pi to give all the fingerprints of their downloads. Um, they, they're useful, but what they don't do is provide us provenance. And the reason for that is that the source of the fingerprint isn't any different from the source of the download. If the attacker can attack one, they can attack the other. So it's not really providing us extra security. But I'll get into later on, I'll get into systems that could provide us with that type of assurance. It's used in systems like Tripwire, which provide us with a uh, sanity check for the entire operating system and shows us if a an attacker maliciously modified a file somewhere in that operating system. And again, there are, there are better ways of doing that now that we'll come to uh, when we look at um, digital signatures. But again, even the new systems are still making use of Message Digest. They've just got some other stuff as well. Uh, fingerprints are widely used in PGP, uh, which the which was the original uh, program and open PGP, which is the specification, the open specification. And uh, they're used to uh, provide provenance of uh, digital public keys. And I'll show you how that works a bit later when we have a module specifically on um, public, key, public key cryptography and open PGP. And I use them widely in my system, the mathematical mesh, and what I did there was to design a new fingerprint function. And the reason for that was that the traditional fingerprint uh, presentation is hexadecimal. That's base 16, which uses four, which gets four bits of information out of each character. Now, since there are 26 letters and 10 digits, you know, that's 36. That's close. That's uh, more than two to the power 32. So we could have five bits of information per character. So I wanted to use base 32. And the other thing I wanted to be able to do was to put the message digest algorithm into the digest, into the fingerprint presentation so that then I was proof against the downgrade attack. And uh, I, I go into the details of how UDF is constructed and the many additional uses of UDF fingerprints besides just using them for message digests in the mathematical mesh videos and those are videos number six and seven if you're interested. Okay so another thing that we can use uh, message digests for all on their own is as an authentication scheme and this is because they are a one-way function. Now what I'm going to do here is to invent a piece of nomenclature that I've not heard before, but I think we need, and that is a one-way sequence. Because this, just as one-way functions keep turning up again and again and again, and there are many different slight variations, uh, this idea of a one-way sequence is going to turn up again and again and again. It's useful to have a portmanteau for it. So, uh, the guy who worked this out was a guy called Leslie Lamport, which if you were a graduate student and you wrote a thesis, uh, chances are, if it involved a lot of math, you used a package called LaTeX. 
and it's the same Leslie Landport that wrote the LaTeX book, the, the light blue one, and wrote the LaTeX um, uh, macro package. And he, you know, he won, won a Turing Award for some other stuff uh, later on. Um, and S-Key was one of his inventions. And it's a very interesting authentication scheme. Uh, it, what, I don't think that he implemented it itself, but the first guy that we know did implement it was a guy called Phil Kahn, who implemented it for authentication over ham radio. Now, why did he need to authenticate himself over ham radio? Well, I don't know why he needed the function, but the reason that he couldn't use encryption to authenticate himself is that there's some rule in the ham radio world that you are not allowed to use encryption. So, you know, you've got a world-class cryptographer who is not using encryption. I, and, you know, I, I don't know what they do if you, you know, how do they know if this Morse code is encrypted or not? Uh, you know, do they come and break your fingers or your uh, key, your teletype key or whatever? I don't know. But, um, yeah. So he wasn't allowed to use encryption. So the basic idea of S-Key is that Alice is going to, choose a random number and you know we, we're going to call that and in the trade we call random numbers of this sort we call them a nonce because they used one so we, we chart off with a random seed okay she's then going to put it through her message digest function and so she'll get h1 out and then she'll take the result and she'll put the result through the message digest function again and the result will be h2 and we'll keep doing that, so H3, H4, all the way up to H100. And she'll take that result and she will give that result to Bob. And so the next day, when Alice wants to authenticate herself on her ham radio, she types out the first, she, she types out H100, okay, which was the secret that she passed to Bob the previous day out of band. And Bob now knows it's Alice. And, you know, this is, you know, this is secure, but, uh, you know, why do we need the hash functions? I mean, like, it's, we're just using this as a password at this time. Well, the interesting thing happens the next day. So what Alice does the next day is that she sends H99. Now, Bob and potentially an attacker in the channel already know H100. So that's not going to be uh, an authentication scheme. You know, that's not on a proof of knowledge of anything. But when Alice releases H99, that's something that only Alice could know. Because, you know, Bob can't calculate it from H100 and Mallet can't uh, calculate it either. Oh, uh, the eavesdropper in the, ca in the channel, uh, we call him Mallet. Well, sometimes it's Eve, but in this case, it's Mallet. Okay, and the next day, Alice releases H98, and then H97, and so on. And this actually makes for a pretty good authentication scheme. Um, it's robust, it's secure, and, you know, you can come up with some really nice uh, proofs of security for it. Um, you know, each day, you, you just have this one-way sequence, and you just step back one unit every day, until you've got to H0, at which point Alice has to share another secret out of band. Now, this system has actually be, was actually proposed by a guy called uh, Torben Pedersen, and also independently by Ron Rivest, as a payment scheme. Uh, and it's a very interesting payment scheme, because what you do is you do an expensive communication use you know transaction using public key and some really time consuming performance degrading uh, crypto and then you you use that to establish your h of 100 and then you can if you call that a dollar you can spend 1 cent by releasing h99 and move backwards and backwards and backwards all the time uh, until you spent your whole dollar. So it's a really nice way of um, amortizing an expensive crypto operation over a large number of inexpensive ones. 
Uh, Pedersen called it the phone tick modus and uh, Rivest called it pay word. And, you know, they're both very, very interesting schemes. And, you know, uh, if, if I did another payment uh, proposal, I think I'd probably be uh, still using them. Now, the one-way sequence, um, that idea was uh, turned into a notary proposal by two guys called Haber and Stonetta. And their problem was that, you know, this in the uh, late 1980s, the whole world was going digital, but we were starting to see the problems of the digital world that everything was malleable. You know, you have an email and anybody can come in and edit it afterwards. Um, you have uh, an image, you know, digital cameras were just starting to become uh, practical. I mean, they existed for some time, but you know, they were just starting to become um, vaguely affordable. And so um, the malleability of the digital world was starting to trouble them. And so the, what they were wanting to do was to bring some of the permanence of the physical world into the digital. And so um, imagine that you've got a corpus of documents that you need to notarize. And it could be a bunch of court papers. It could be a, uh, a lab notes of a researcher who is going to apply for a patent. And it's very important that you fix the fact that these notes existed at a particular point in time. Okay, so how could we do that? Well, it's difficult, it's impossible to do in the purely digital domain. You need something external from your digital world that to provide you with something firm that can't be uh, modified. And Harbour and Stinetta propose bringing something in from the physical world. So let's, let's look at this in stages. So imagine you wanted to use the New York Times as your source of notarization. So one approach would be, let's just publish all the documents we want to notarize verbatim in the New York Times. Well, that's obvious nonsense because we want confidentiality. We don't want to disclose the documents. So the first transformation we want to make is we're going to take the message digest and publish them. Okay, so that's better. And, you know, it's reduced the size of the, the, uh, the newspaper we need to publish uh, for a start. But, you know, this list of digest, if we're doing a million documents a day, and, you know, there are billions being written on the web, um, you know, we're going to run out of space on, in the newspaper. So the next idea is, okay, instead of taking all those documents and publishing the digest of each one, we're going to take the digest of the lists of digests. And so we start to have this idea of a structure of message digests appearing. Okay, so now we only have one message digest that we have to print each day. But we've still got a bit of a problem because, you know, if we come to a court case, well, we have to find one particular copy of this newspaper and we have to prove that that's not been modified. And, you know, faking one copy of one newspaper, you know, if, if we had a billion dollars at stake, which you can easily have in a patent suit, well, that's, uh, that would make it more than worthwhile to set up a fake printing press and uh, fake that newspaper. So we've really not got enough purchase there from one physical object. And you've also got the problem that, you know, as libra you know, libraries have a big problem storing all their newspapers. Uh, there are very, uh, if you, I'm a member of the Oxford Union and one of the things they had in the library, uh, in the cellar, was all the copies of the Times, the London Times. And, you know, it's enormous. Um, and, you know, some of them get eaten by rats and uh, mold and so on. So, you know, it's not very practical either. So what we want to do is to find a way of having one digest function that can authenticate all the message digest outputs for all the days that came before. And so what you could do is each day we just sign the list of all the previous digests. But 
Actually, that's not necessary. All we need to do is to sign the digest of the previous day and then the entire chain will lock into to place and become a one-way sequence, sequence. Because if we modify any of the input documents by one single bit, the digest of that document will change. That will change the document, that will change the notary digest of that day. And that will change all the succeeding digest outputs into eternity. And that's a really, really powerful result. So what this, so this is a really powerful uh, concept precisely because message digests are so powerful. And if you fiddle with them upstream, the downstream consequences uh, go on forever. So this was proposed by, a, uh, by Harbour and Stanetta. It was patented in 1990. And then a company called Surety sat on the patent and did absolutely nothing of interest with it for the next 20 years. And we'll get back to that uh, a little later. Okay, so we have this chain and, you know, it's effective as far as security goes, but it's not really uh, satisfactory as far as performance goes. If we are wanting to use this as a notary system in a running system, well, we've only got granularity to the day and we have to, to validate the sequence from the start to the finish in order to be sure that uh, the data has not been uh, modified to come up with a proof. And so a guy called Ralph Merkel, uh, who together with Whit Diffie and uh, Marty Hellman, uh, was one of the uh, founders of public key cryptography. Um, uh, uh, Marty Hellman's always uh, keen to make sure that uh, Ralph Merkel gets uh, the credit he deserves because you know his name wasn't on the algorithm and you know okay so uh so he invented what was called the merkel tree so the idea here is that instead of having a sequential structure that's going to require us to um you know th the length is going to increase over time and the computational complexity is going to go up with n where n is the number of links what he said was, let's build a tree structure, a binary tree, and that will then allow us to have, to make, instead of the performance going up with L, it will go up, it will go with log two of L. And that's a really, really powerful result, because what it means is that um, we could insert uh, new elements into our tree. It costs us log two now. You know, right before writes were only took us one unit of time. Now writes take us um, log n, and reads take us log n instead of n. So it really speeds the system up. And this particular approach is used in a system called certificate transparency, which I'll get to later when I'm talking about PKI. And I also use it at in my data at rest envelope sequence. Dare sequence, uh, which is described in videos 8, 9, and 10 of the MeSH videos. Okay, so we've seen how we can use message digest functions and a one-way sequence to notarize a document. That is, fix that document at a particular place in time. Now, we can also use a message digest function to sign that document. That is, establish that a particular person authorized it at a particular uh, point uh, and this is a, a situ system called a digital signature and it's a type of public key cryptography now i'm not going to go into detail on that now because we've not done public key cryptography and digital signatures uh, are, you know belong there however lamport's scheme is interesting because he invented his Lamport signature before the public schemes were out but there. Uh, public, the traditional public key sing, schemes were out there. And it is a form of digital signature that is resistant to quantum cryptanalysis, by which it means uh, 
trying to break it using a quantum computer. And the reason that we're now getting in, increasingly in, interested in hash signatures is because quantum computers have gone from being science fiction to kind of sort of science fact. You know, I've used a quantum computer, hurrah, it has had five qubits. Oh, that's not very many, is it? You know, you need a lot more to break public key cryptography. But, you know, there's a risk that somebody might build one that has significant size in the next 10 or 20 years. And so Lamport signatures have suddenly become very interesting. And as a result, the IRTF, which is a part of the same organization that the ITF is part of, um, published a standard for Lamport signatures uh, called XMSS in May 2018, which is probably the longest period of time from the proposal of a novel technology to it becoming a documented standard. Now that was uh, about 40 years, I guess. Okay, so we'll come back to Lamport signatures because they're useful. So what I want to talk about next is another feature of Message Digest is that they're a very convenient way of providing proof of work. What is proof of work? Well, back in the early days when spam started to first move from being a minor nuisance to a major nuisance to a denial of service attack on email, you know, the killer application of the internet was at in danger of being killed. Well, people were looking at that and some people were saying, well, the reason that we don't get spam in the postal mail system, well, hello, you've never had any junk mail? You know, most of my postal mail is junk mail these days. Okay, the reason we do not get any spam in the postal mail system is that you have to put a stamp on each one. It costs you money. And so the solution to email spam is to raise the cost of sending an email. And of course, all these particular proposals that were being made were always of the sort, well, obviously somebody's going to have to collect that cent per email. Oh, who could that be? Yeah, you know, it, it was inevitably the person proposing it or they wanted a small cut of, of the amount of money. And so uh, in the middle of all this, Adam Back suggested hash cash. So the idea here is that we're going to raise the cost of sending a message, but nobody's going to be able to con collect that money. And so it's not really a payment system, but it does provide impose a cost on people trying to send email. So what's the idea? Well, what we do is we take the message and we take a uh, another piece of data, which we call a nonce, and we're going to put the two pieces of data through a hash function and get a result. And that result will be uh, a validator on that message, provided that the first 20 bits, say, are all zeros. OK, so what do, do we have to do to get such a bit stream? Well, we have to do two to the power 20 uh, attempts uh, to, on average, to, uh, sorry, we have two, 10, 2 to 5, 19 on average, and we will have a, uh, a string that matches the con condition. And, you know, sometimes it'll take more time, sometimes it'll take less. Um, it's a proof of work. It, we can provide a proof that the sender of this message wasted a certain amount of computing resources in order to send the message. And so, of course, you know, just like the other payment systems, it didn't get anywhere, but it did actually stop people talking about payments on emails as a way of stopping spam because it kind of belled the cat that, you know, this was never about stopping spam. It was about erecting a toll booth. And once there was a spam stopper without the toll booth, well, interest waned. OK, so we can set the proof of work to any work factor we choose. Uh, we, or at least a work factor in terms of number of operations. Obviously, if you've got a big machine 
you're going to be able to produce more proofs than if you've got a small machine. And if you hack into a large number of machines on the net and set up a botnet uh, and have those all producing the proofs of sending the message, well, you, uh, this isn't really, you're going to be able to send an enormous amount of spam anyway. One of the reasons that this never really took off uh, for sending spam was that the obvious workaround for proof of work was to hack into people's computers and turn them into a botnet. Okay, so proof of work didn't really get anywhere for uh, stopping spam, but where, what it did get to is it turned into a payment system in that uh, a number of people uh, started to look at proof of work as a basis for a payment system in which you would actually transfer money. And in around 2010, the Harbour Stinetta uh, one-way sequence patent started to uh, expire. And so seven months before the expiry, uh, a scheme called blockchain and Bitcoin was launched onto uh, the cryptography list that I'm on. And first person to reply was a guy called Hal Finney, uh, who we later know was discovered, had recently been diagnosed with ALS, and was almost certainly the person who really invented Bitcoin. Um, the reason I suspect that he launched it when he did uh, and that he remained pseudonymous was because um, the patent holders could have come after him for the uh, money and demanded a share of the Genesis blocks. But, you know, none of that happened. So, uh, what Bitcoin does is it uh, combines the proof of work idea and the one-way sequence idea to produce a payment scheme. And the way that it works is this. Okay, so every 10 minutes on average, a new block is added to the blockchain by means of a proof of work. So the uh, new block is going to be worth a certain number of coins. It's st at the start it was worth 50 coins and then that half to 25 and so on uh, every four years I think. Um, and so you would get a certain amount of currency in return for solving this proof of work problem. And the way that the proof of work problem is set up is that the target value that you have to find is a product of the digest of the last block. And so each time that you add a block, you add, you, you set the challenge for adding the block that is to come. And when you solve this problem, you don't just solve it over the previous block, you also take a list of proposed transactions and you take the hash of those and those go into your uh, submission. And so what the proof of work uh, comes down to is people trying to extend the blockchain and find that next block that will give them the 50 coins or 25 coins or whatever. And in the process, they're also providing the notarization over the transactions that happen in that 10 minute period. And so the blockchain keeps chugging along and this has some really nice properties that maybe we'll come to someday where if we do a, um, a module just on blockchain and Bitcoin. So the technology is very neat and very uh, and uh, technically it's very sound you know Hal really did know his stuff the problem is that there's more to bitcoin than just the blockchain and so when you're looking at the security of uh, of something security is a property of a system and not the technology you can use perfect cryptography and still have a breakable system and you know some people have gone to the electric chair as a result of that and we'll come to that uh, in the next uh, module so security is a property of your system and because the blockchain you know the message digest at root is an integrity control 
it's not providing you with confidentiality. Uh, now, there was a thing called anonymous digital cash developed by a guy called uh, David Chown, who I know. And, you know, that produces uh, a really strong proof of anonymity. You know, you, you, you can't link uh, coins uh, to who, who spent them. It's very neat that way. But Bitcoin isn't an anonymous digital cash system. Uh, all the transactions that happen in Bitcoin are in the ledger. It's an open transaction system. There's no anonymity at all. All you have is pseudonymity in that people don't have to declare their names when they're issued with wallets. Uh, so it doesn't provide the confidentiality guarantees that a lot of people assume. And also when you look at the whole system, well, it's not fraud pre uh, free either. I, really, it's not. I mean, like, you know, Mt. Gox, the largest Bitcoin exchange, uh, turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. Uh, there's one Ponzi scheme after another in the crypto the currency space. And all the time people are saying, well, yeah, that's not us. You know, that's nothing to do with us. And it's kind of like, yeah, but there's no way for a participant in these schemes to know whether they're involved in the Ponzi cryptocurrency or the non-Ponzi cryptocurrencies. They both look exactly the same from the outside. And so when you look at the security of these cryptocurrencies, it's really actually very weak because what we're seeing is vastly more fraud within the systems than transactions taking place. You know, we're saying multi-billions of dollars worth of fraud every year and not a great deal of money being trans transmitted from one country to another using Bitcoin. And where it is being used, it's almost invariably to escape exchange controls or for sale of narcotics or child porn or payments for ransomware. So security is a property of a system and maybe some people need to think hard before they get so excited about um, blockchain and Bitcoin. But one-way sequences are a very interesting technology and they're worth considering and they are still valuable. Okay, so that's it for applications of message digests. In the next module, we're going to be looking at confidentiality and encryption, or rather we're going to be looking at the a, particular, a type of encryption called symmetric encryption in which you use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. And we're also going to be using uh, a perfect cipher. that is such a thing. A mathematically pure cipher that we can prove cannot be broken. And we'll also be seeing how two traitors, well, at least one traitor and his wife, went to the electric chair because that perfect cipher was broken. So please join me for that. Please hit subscribe, please hit like, and please share this as widely as possible. Right. What, one of the, you know, people have always been saying that not enough people in the computer world understand security. And so now that you know, we're all working from home and we can't go out, Let's put that to good use and let's actually get people uh, the training that they need in one of the most important concepts in computer security. So please hit like, please hit subscribe. Thank you for watching and please come back for that perfect cipher in the next module. Thank you very much.